Hello and welcome to episode number 304 of the Armin Show podcast. On this one, we're switching it up into the category of economics. Who do we have on this episode? We have Professor Jan Ikaut. He has written the book, The Profit Paradox. It is economically related. I like the alliteration in the name. Jan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful thing. Now, you are a professor at Pompu Fabra University in Barcelona and have taught at various universities. How did you get to where you are? It's a long story, but basically I'm, I'm married to someone from Barcelona. And then after years in the U.S., uh, we decided to move back to Barcelona. And that's uh, how I ended up here. That makes sense. What have been the key universities or people along the way that led to where you currently are? Is there any people that they led to your current position? I mean, I guess there's always people, but I, I, I had a I guess fairly usual trajectory. I mean, I did my PhD in, in London at the LSC and then moved to the US. I was at UPenn for 10 years. And in the meantime, I've spent some time at NYU, at Princeton, and also at University College London back when I was already back in, in Barcelona. I, was, I had a part-time appointment there. And I guess, you know, I think the environment determines a lot what kind of work you do. So I think there is an important component. I can't pinpoint one particular person or uh, um, event, but it's definitely true that I've always felt that the type of questions I, I started working on and became interested in were completely determined by, by who I had around me and, and what inspired them ended up inspiring me. Makes sense. The value of chance meetings along the way, I talked about that recently, but it directs you a little bit. That's cool. Now, you are expertise in, or you have expertise in the category of economics. What ca parts of economics have you most focused on in your career? I would say I focused most on macroeconomics and labor markets. And so that's a very broad category, but it basically means anything that's related to the economy as a whole, not particularly one industry or one particular business uh, and, and, and labor in a sense of anything that, that relates to either unemployment, wages, uh, all kinds of issues related to compensation. Um, and these are obviously very closely linked to what goes into macroeconomy. You know, there's a crisis, there's more unemployment, uh, inflation goes up and really real wages are effectively going down because, you know, your nominal wages may not pick up immediately. And so that's the tight connection between I would say macroeconomics on the one hand and, and labor uh, markets on the other. Mm -hmm. In terms of economics, do you think of each year like in a ranking, like 2014 was a great year and 2017 was not a good year globally? Is there a thought like that in economics? I don't really think like that. It's an interesting idea and I would, would want to give it kind of an, an, an opportunity as a potential. I think of the economy as, some, as like a slow moving boat. And, you know, more uh, uh, an oil tanker or a container ship than, than a sailing boat in the sense that you can switch uh, very quickly in which direction it goes. And so when things are going well, then it's, you know, it's going full speed up and it, it's, it keeps going. And then even though a recession hits, you might think, oh, what, what, what happens, you know, stock market drops, but then the economy itself, you know, adjusts very slowly and then unemployment may start to grow but then it takes a long while before this all kind of feeds through and and it takes ages before that recession is over it may be that the stock market has recuperated in, in let's say half a year or a year as we saw with the covid uh, uh, recession now but you know unemployment takes much longer and then productivity may take time to pick up and and, and you know in a sense even though recessions, let's me just throw out some numbers there, but a typical cycle between boom and, and recession is about 10 years. And let's say a recession is typically something like, you know, half a year or a year, people talk about the recession much longer. And that's because that recovery process is much longer because even though, you know, GDP has picked up or even before the stock market has recuperated the values it had before the recession, unemployment is still high. And then we're still you know, in a recession for the unemployed. And, and, and that's kind of that slow moving boat. And that's more how I think about the economy rather than saying, you know, 
uh, are, are we in a kind of in a, in a gray year versus another year? I mean, I, I don't think that the, the changes are that, that abrupt. And, and in fact, what I, I really think is that these, let me say, 10 year cycles are themselves part of a much longer kind of even slower moving boat. And that's progress, technological progress, but where we also have things, you know, sometimes messing with it and, and, and things not functioning as they should. I like that you mentioned that. It sort of is, that feels like 10 year cycles. I keep seeing there's something to that. That's cool. Now, your book, the catchphrase after it is how thriving firms threaten the future. And this made me think of somebody I know who always for many years has talked about this concept of labor and its value not being given to the workers. So connection to this, what led to this specific book being written? What led to it is a number of facts that people, academics and policymakers and people in a broader public writing about these issues had noticed and that there's a number of long-term developments that we don't really understand or I think we didn't understand, we understand more of it, but you know, again, at a, a longer duration than a, a normal boom and bust cycle. So, so I would, I'm talking here about 40 years, okay, four decades. And these, these developments are things of the sort that um, have to do with, with you know, changes in, for example, wages that stagnate, while at the same time we see productivity continues to, to rise. Another one is that we see what we call business dynamism, dynamism declining. And what is that? That means that basically people move jobs more slowly, get promoted more slowly, move between states more slowly, and we see kind of a more stagnant economy. You could say, well, jobs are more secure, but at the same time, there's less opportunities and there's a cost to that. Another thing is that we, you know, despite the fact that we're in, let's say, the, the, the high tech age, the number of startups has halved in the last 30 years. And you would think, you know, no startups? Well, no, we see actually far fewer firms, newly started firms uh, in, in the current days than we, we saw back then. And so all these long-term trends have, you know, caught the attention of, of research and people have been looking into this and, and what kind of uh, uh, brings it all together, I think, is, is, is the fact that there is a relationship to that. And I think that has to do with the, the role of dominant firms and these, these large firms, you know, use their dominance and, and, and we can show in our research that this basically has an effect on, on these macroeconomic outcomes that I was referring to before, these labor market outcomes. And that's what the book is about. The book is trying to explain in a non-technical way what exactly is going on. Why is it that first of all, these dominant firms exist? And second, given that they exist, how do they affect what's going on in the economy? Mm -hmm. Now, one visual that's come up in my mind for many years about this concept, whether it's for companies or for people that reach to something first, is like the idea of like going to the second floor and having a little success. And then the ladder that you use to get to the second floor, pulling it out so that the other people can't get to the second floor, even though you used it. Would you say that that applies to companies as they get larger or even a, just a general person when they reach for something and then they have the opportunity to remove the path to how they got there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good way of describing it. Of course, every market, every firm, every large firm is, is different, but I think it's, it's, it's a fairly uh, accurate uh, kind of description. And, and the issue is that what has happened in the last four decades is something that I think is somewhat ambiguous in the following sense. I think the main driver of this is technological change and it's fast technological change. And what does that mean? That means that this brings us, you know, better quality of life, new and better products uh, at lower prices, so more cost efficient. And this is all great, right? And we wanna, in many ways, we wanna we want to continue to have this and, and the firms that, that make those investments to achieve that, they should be rewarded by, by higher profits and, and by a return to that. And this is something that, you know, we believe is, is central to uh, a, a market economy. Now, what has happened at the same time, and this is coming back to your metaphor of, of, of pulling out the ladder, is that these new technologies, because they change so fast 
and because they have particular features, um, these, have, these have been used by these firms that were in those markets first to basically keep out competitors. And, and why can you keep out competitors? Because, well, some of the, these markets have what we would call network effects. And you think of, say, eBay, why, what's the advantage of eBay? If I go to eBay and have something to sell, I want there to be a lot of buyers. And if a buyer comes to eBay, they want there to be a lot of sellers. So scale increases the value. What it means is that there's only basically room for one auction platform. And Yahoo auctions have been trying to come in and they haven't been able to. eBay dominates the market. And despite you know, the potential for competition, eBay can charge six, seven, eight, nine percent per transaction. Okay, it doesn't cost them that much. I mean, their technology is fairly cheap to operate, but because you know, they have such a, a kind of a prime location, if you want, in the real estate that they occupied as being number one in this auction platform market means that no one else can or even wants to come in because, you know, even if you invest in there, you cannot kind of make it. Now you could say, and this is eBay's answer to that, we have a superior technology, we're better than Yahoo Auctions. But that doesn't hold water when you look at what happens in Japan because in Japan, Yahoo Auctions was first and eBay can't get in that market. Yahoo dominates there. So it's not an issue that the platform is better. It's just that, you know, being there first means that you have the size and the scale and that is basically allowing you to pull up the ladder on the second floor. So the ones that are lower down can't make it. Now, not every market is like that. I mean, Amazon, for example, is a market where it's about pure scale again, but now in terms of logistics and, and really brick and mortar setting up that that uh, uh, distribution network, of course, very highly levered with, with technology and, and, and with the ability to, to really deliver things at a very low cost. And all of that has a very positive side to it. Okay, The, the, the success of Amazon is that they can produce or deliver stuff to your doorstep at a much lower cost than anyone else can. And this is great. But this cost reduction is not passed on to the customer. Why? Because there's only one Amazon. If there was two Amazons competing, then you'd see lower prices, even lower than they are now, because we love Amazon because they're lower priced than competitors, but they could go down quite a bit further. And they don't have to do that. They don't have to do that because there's no competitor. Why? Because no one in their right minds is going to say, I'm going to set up the same logistics and distribution networks that uh, uh, Amazon has, because once we're there, we're going to compete like hell. And therefore, there's not going to be any profit. So it's not worth to make that, that uh, investment. And so what we see is that with these new developments, new markets, the ones who were first kind of broke those markets, had that scale that allowed them to keep out competitors. And then, you know, after that fierce competition for the market, there hasn't been any competition in that market. Okay, so once you have that market, you see limited uh, competition in there. And that's something that we observe, not just you know, in this tech firm, we see it in textiles, we see it in, in, in other sectors as well. Of course, very often in these other sectors, tech has something to do with it. If, if a textiles firm that uh, distributes you know, high-speed clothing uh, is dominant, it's, it's very often because they use very intensively you know, high-tech to do their logistics. And in a sense, uh, it, it looks like a tech firm, but they're in a standard or a traditional sector. This is a concept that I think about sometimes is that first mover advantage is a huge thing and it almost dominates the space. And then to come in even a year after, five years after, you nearly have no chance or you can be like a second tier where they get 80% and you get some 20% of the market and that's about it. I think like evolutionarily, maybe that's like they took care of that and on to the next thing we should go. What is a potential, but also I don't like the stagnation aspect of it because when the competition is gone, now it's like there's a, there's like a deadness to it. There's no more of that lively trying. What is a counterbalance to this kind of phenomenon so that there's still energy for other companies in the same space to feel like they have some opportunity? Is there any counterbalance? In the very long run, I think there is counterbalance, you know, Walmart probably had a position like that in the 80s and, and it wasn't until maybe uh, the, the late 90s, 2000s when, when Amazon came in that they faced some competition. 
And so in the very, and you could say maybe Sears and companies like that had, had similar positions. So in the very long run, there may be technological change that, you know, if you had say canals in the 19th century, they were, you know, basically local monopolies until the railroads came. And that, that yeah, kind of a, a, a change in paradigm will do it. But the, the point is that if it takes really decades or even centuries before that happens, there's too much damage done in the meantime. And the, the, the point is that, you know, eBay or Facebook as a company is, has done its investment, has kind of broken at first ground and, and, and has made a huge contribution to uh, those markets by, by basically uh, innovating. But the way they're operating now is without any competition. And, you know, of course, something will eventually happen to Facebook, the same thing, the same way that, that something happened to Standard Oil or to, to the railroad companies in, in, at the turn of the last century. These dominant firms were at some point, you know, basically the, the attacked by some competitor. The, the question is, do we have to, to wait for another four or five decades before that happens? And, and, and the, 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 the thing to recognize is that with these new technologies, when firms can exploit these returns to scale, as we call them, these scale economies of the, the advantage of being big and therefore keep out competitors, if you recognize that that's part of some of these sectors, some of these industries, then there's actually simple things that you can do. You can actually intervene. We have antitrust uh, legislation. We have regulation that allows us to intervene and, and do certain things to make those markets more competitive. Let me give you an example of such an intervention, which is uh, when I compare my phone plan in the United States with AT&T and I compare it to the plan that I have here in, in Europe, I pay about three times as much for AT&T, two and a half to three times. And then you ask, okay, what is it? What's different? Technology is the same, okay? It's basically 3G, 4G, 5G now. So this has evolved in a similar way. Um, so it's not a matter of innovation. It's not a matter of, of different kind of technologies that allow you, you to, 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 to get a difference or get an edge. Second, you know, the population of the United States is around 360 million. The European Union is uh, about 400 million. These are similar economies. What is going on? Well, in, in, in the European Union, and it's not because of some kind of uh, uh, visionary uh, intervention, it was it had to do with the integration of the different countries. They included a law for uh, telecom that said, if I want to operate as an outsider on the network of a company's kind of cell towers, okay, they have to allow me. So I come in here and say this market, I, I look at Spain, I like the market, I say, I wanna compete here. I don't have to build cell towers. The regulator has imposed that at a transfer price, the owner of the cell towers has, has to allow, say, a voter from, from the UK to come in and say, plug in your devices, and now you can start competing immediately. What it does is it creates competition on the network immediately. It means that the local owner who doesn't like Vodafone to come on, okay, that owner now sees in its own market competitors setting prices in order to capture customers and the prices go down. Second, you don't need that kind of investment in order to be operational, right? So, so Vodafone doesn't have to first say, oh, let's do a five-year plan and build that cell tower network, which is very expensive to build. They don't have to do it because the network is there. So this uh, stands to show that, that if you can exploit the benefits of scale with these networks, but at the same time in, in kind of induce competition on that network, then you get basically the best of both, both worlds. You get the efficiency gains from scale and you get at the same time competition on these networks. And there's ways in which in other markets to do similar things, that is exploit scale and at the same time ensure that there's enough competition so that prices uh, fall. And the result of that, to come back to the example of telecom, in the US there's three or four operators that dominate the whole market. In the European Union, there's about 150. Okay, and it's obvious why, because anyone can come in and grab a little market and say, I'm going to try to compete there. I don't have to make a huge upfront investment. There's still incentives, by the way, to set up the network because the transfers by the regulator are set, set in such a way that they're uh, still interesting for the, the builder of the network to innovate and to put a large and, and efficient enough uh, uh, network. The network example makes some good sense. I like that idea of keeping the base the same 
so that everybody can p- compete with the base versus one company has their own solid base, doesn't allow the others to have the base. And obviously they're not going to be able to compete because we don't have the same network or the infrastructure. So I like that idea of the keeping that base. Now, on the other hand, I always start with the optimistic end, but what have been some of the negatives from companies having this mindset of uh, keeping the base just for themselves and not allowing others to compete on that same level? What have been some of the negatives we've seen? So first of all, let, let, let me say that many of these companies have at least in the past, innovated heavily and continues sometimes to, and in most of the cases to innovate. So it, it's not that they've, they're doing, you know, a disfavor by their existence. I mean, that, that's not, not, not the case, but it does have an effect, which is the following that as these firms set too high prices for what they sell, for the products they sell, what happens is they, they sell too few of those. So they could sell at a lower price and they could, uh, given their efficiently low cost, they could actually lower the prices even further without making losses and still still make a a, a nice profit. So what happens is that by setting too high a price, they produce too little because customers, fewer customers buy them at a lower price. And if you produce too little, what happens is, well, you need less labor to produce it. You might say, well, for these tech firms, you don't need labor, but even you know, selling a cell phone means that it comes with apps. Those apps are programmed by people. Uh, these cell phones come with uh, customer service plans, so they are run out of call centers, and so on and so on. And so if you sell fewer units of the good that you're selling at too high a price, you basically affect economy-wide the demand for labor. Now, it is not that Google treats its own workers badly. I mean, everyone would love to work for Google. They pay very well. It's a very nice working environment. But the point is that what the Googles, the Apples, the you know uh, other firms that have market power uh, have as an effect is that being so large together, not individually they are large, but also together, they have a macroeconomic effect on wages. And that is what we see in the wage stagnation. So people who do kind of you know, typical jobs, working jobs, the salaries of those people in 1980 were as high as they are today in real terms, adjusted for inflation. So these people haven't seen any increase in their wages, whereas at the same time, productivity of the economy overall has, has been growing steadily. And so how can it happen? Well, precisely because you know these firms basically demand too little labor for, labor for what they in fact generate and and what they generate in exchange for them is of course is profits and that's exactly the profit paradox that whatever's good for these uh, profits of the firm when they are generated with market power not just innovation i mean when there's innovation it's great to have profits but when they're generated with market power just such as an ebay who doesn't have to innovate anything and just can cash in the seven eight percent on every transaction without doing anything if that's the case what that generates is basically you know growth in profits but not a healthy economy and the unhealthy economy is not just in these wages but it also has to do with the number of startups that are down that i mentioned earlier the fact that business dynamism is lower so there's less innovation the fact that we see an increase in kind of the the, the, the difference in in terms of the lowest salaries and then the, the higher salaries and all these things are basically driven by these dominant firms that are keeping out other competitors and, and selling their goods at too high prices they have a dominant force that they bring to the table I have seen you had graphs and talked about statistics about how the actual wages uh, are separating heavily from the profits of the companies and the inequality in that way has been increasing over the past, it looks like decades. Have you ever seen an economy where that goes back to a not being as far off from one another? Or is it always the case that when an economy starts to go too far into inequity that the whole society has to crumble in some way? Well, that's a great question. And and, and I hope the answer is that we can see it. The closest I can come to a similar situation was indeed the turn of the last century in the early 1900s. 
when there was the rise of these dominant firms, Standard Oil, with uh, uh, individuals like Rockefeller, and then railways and banking with J.P. Morgan and Carnegie and and, and Mellon and and these uh, Schwab, these these kind of individuals that created in a similar way these dominant firms. I mean, today they would be you know. Zuckerberg, there would be uh, um, Gates, there would be kind of the, the, those individuals uh, f from, from, from that time. Now, what happened then was that there was, you know, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the president, the US president, then there was an, an, a drive, by the way, he was a Republican, so he's more like a, a, a pro-business uh, person. He realized that this growth of these dominant firms was actually bad for the economy bad for the economy because, by the way, it's not just bad for workers, it's also bad for small business. It's bad for the type of businesses that innovate, for startups. And so he realized that, and, and we got the name for it, the, the trust buster, because he set up regulation and he appointed people to, to basically try and do something about it. The sad thing, of course, is that it didn't end well because by 1914, and I'm not saying that that's the, the, the direct cause, but the, there was one war and then in 1929, uh, a Great Depression, and by 1940, a second war. Well, this brought these tensions back together and the economy brought the productivity in line with, with wages, but it, it was a very costly process to do so. I'm hopeful we don't have to go through something like that right now. Um, but I think it, it's, it's high time that we start to think about where it is this going, because, you know, if you look just at, for example, the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones is at over 34,000. It's been growing at nearly 7% in real terms uh, every single year over the last four uh, decades. Notice that this wasn't the case before that. The Dow Jones was growing much slower before that. In fact, the value of the Dow Jones in 1981 was exactly the same as in 1945 in real terms. So there had been a lot of inflation in the meantime, but, you know, and therefore the nominal Dow Jones was higher, but in real terms, it hadn't grown. We're seeing a very unusual development in terms of growth of profits, because stock market valuation is basically profits. If a firm is profitable, people are willing to pay a lot for their stock. And that is precisely the thing that, you know, the sky is the limit, where is this going to go? Dow Jones 40,000, for sure, we're going to see that. But then what are the consequences? What's going to happen to these consequences? How, how, how much further uh, can, can, can this uh, endure? In terms of it enduring, you talk about antitrust litigation in the book. Should there be an increase in the amount of I guess, analysis of the large firms at this current time that are the well-known companies? Or does that not work? If you put a lot of governmental pressure on them, are they likely to start to break off part of their pieces into sub-companies that are separate? Or is that resisted very strongly? I mean, it's clear that these companies will resist any intervention, whether it's regulation or whether it's, it's, it's lawsuits. They, they, they will not like it because if if you have such a, a valuable company that that's basically valuable because it generates so such high profits because of the market power that they have the high prices that they can charge they're not very willing to give up on that i mean that that's going to be obvious now let's take the viewpoint of society what's good for society well what's good for society is basically i think competition competition means that you have anyone who can come in and can produce something at better terms and can sell it at lower prices and can be more cost efficient, should basically manage to take the larger share of the market. Now we know how competitive markets work and when they do not. And for example, when there are these barriers to entry, when there are these scale economies, when there are these network effects, the market economy doesn't work very well. Competition doesn't do its job. I mean, Adam Smith's invisible hand is not delivering. And so what that means is that, you know, we know of ways in which to correct some of that. I don't think we can get it all straight and right uh, uh, ever, but we can do a lot more than what we're doing now. And I gave you the example of this, what we call interoperability in telecom uh, that's in place in, in the European market, it's easy to implement this in the US. 
Now, is AT&T going to like this? No, because it's going to really take a huge bite in their profits because they're going to have to sell your phone plan instead of at whatever it is now, $100 is going to go at $30. And so that's going to make a huge difference for them. And they're going to use whatever means they have available to try and stop that. But that's, you know, their interest. And, and, and in a sense, in, in, in the book, I make a case for taking an approach, let's call it politically or from society as a whole, that is pro-market, pro-competition, which is different from an approach that's pro-business. A pro-business approach, you know, and by the way, pro-business is often equated with pro-market, but these are different things. A pro-business approach is say we have to protect the businesses. If businesses, businesses for whatever reason, can build up a wall around their business, a moat, as uh, uh, as some people call it, that you know stops competition from entering. Of course, that's good for that one business, but it's not good for the competitors who could have been in that market, and it's definitely not good for the customers because they pay higher prices and it's not good for all these consequences that we've been talking about through these macroeconomic effects on the dynamism and innovation uh, in the economy. And so taking a, a, a step away from a pro-business environment, which by the way is only pro a, a small set of businesses, the large ones, and most of the businesses are actually suffering more than anything else. So it's pro kind of a few businesses, okay? Taking an approach or at least an attitude that we really have to go through a pro market uh, 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 mindset, which you know is not easy to achieve because when there are barriers around these firms, when eBay can keep uh, uh, cost, uh, competitors out because there's these network effects, it's not easy to solve this, but we can do a lot more and you mentioned you know, having more resources, having more smart people thinking about this, this is definitely going to be helping. And what we're doing at the moment is is is, is by no means anywhere close to uh, the potential that we have to correct those markets. I like that concept of pro few businesses because that's what it ends up being. It looks like it's like we're, we're supporting this concept, but actually it goes to A, B, and C. And then the one thing I think about in the background is uh, let's say countries like the United States are individualist more so, and some countries uh, like China and some European countries are more community oriented or like group mindset uh, or uh, collectivist. As the world becomes more global, do the individualist countries have a disadvantage because there was more opportunity when there was less interconnection between the whole world and then they could be like an individual strong power. But then when more things are connected globally and Africa and China and India and whatnot, does that put the individualist countries at a disadvantage for not um, looking at some of these guidelines of like checking companies, for example? I, I think that the differences, if they, they have been there in the past are, are disappearing. I think the rest of the world is becoming more like the United States and that maybe the United States becomes more like the rest of the world. And it's for obvious reasons, globalization is, is making the world into one economic area. I mean, there, there are all kinds of barriers potentially like uh, we use different currencies, you have different regulation, people speak different languages, but ultimately we all have the same phones. I mean, in our pockets, we all use the same social networks. And it doesn't matter where you are, um, that that you know these technologies are being used and these products are being sold around the globe, and I think that is precisely the issue that makes the world you know much more uh, uh, uniform than than different. Even if some countries politically might say you know we have differences in mind, we think of different ways of uh, society, but ultimately the economic forces are the same everywhere. And I think the issue uh, at, at, that we're discussing here of, of, of the market power of these firms is a global phenomenon. And in fact, we see that. Notice also that you know these community-oriented economies, you might say, say maybe Germany is one. Well, Bertelsmann, the, 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 the big conglomerate of all the publishers, 
is one of these large dominant firms that basically you know has an effect on the prices of anything published around the world and they own most of the us uh, uh, and, and uk and and any other language uh, publishers so so it's not just a phenomenon in the united states owned by american firms it's also true in europe it's also true in japan it's also true in other uh, countries and these firms that are so dominant also own brands in the us and in japan so you know it's such an intertwined global phenomenon that these differences have to disappear and 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 also the solution has to be a global solution because you cannot start you know with solutions in one particular country because We've seen for tax reasons, firms locate in say Ireland or in the uh, tax havens. Uh, and, and, and that basically, you know, destroys all the potential that you have as a regulator to, to intervene, well, in this case, for, for to, to levy taxes. Regulators go where the customer is, okay? They say, you know, you sell a product in, let me say, you know, a European country, but you're based in the US, you're subject to the regulation in, in the country where you're, where you're you're active, but we see in order for you know have a, a get a hold on the, the the power that these dominant firms have, we have to start thinking about global solutions, not just uh, local solutions. Yeah, I like that you bring up the bigger picture, because to look at it as just one country, another country, that doesn't take into account that there are people or corporations that are multi-country, and so it's not just at the smaller level like that. I like bigger picture concepts. And so then based on that, there would, would there be like a country or set of countries that are poised to do well in the next decade based on current conditions? Or is that not really a way to look at it? I think we either all do well or none will do well. I think it's more a, a, a global outcome and, and, and a global phenomenon. Um, and the, the consequences are everywhere. It is true that we see some of these phenomena or, or consequences more pronounced in some countries, but also we have to take into account that, you know, there's much more redistribution through taxes and, and subsidies in, in Europe than there is in the US. And then you look at, oh, people don't have that much, you know, differences in their salaries, but hold on, let's look at what the firms pay and what they pay and then is redistributed to taxation schemes is very different. And once you start to look at what these firms pay, it doesn't look that different in France than it does look in the United States. Now, of course, what people get into their pockets is different, but, but that's because policy is trying to somehow correct for this. What I'm trying to make a case for is that, that rather than you know, think about taxation and think about redistributing, is let's go to kind of the, the, the root cause of all these effects and all these influences that this has on the macroeconomy and let's look at how competitive these firms are and if we have pro-market pro-competitive policies to ensure that these guys have to compete then we don't have to worry so much about redistributing because you know the market's going to take care of it it's like like a, a very pro-market uh, uh, um, uh, kind of argument that i'm making it makes sense one element i like to look at is are there any or yeah, are there any key individuals who you look to as like a source of information for your viewpoints or um, the mindset you've had, let's say in the last decade or two regarding economics? Is there any people that you look to as key figures? I mean, I, I think there's, there's I, I would say there's, a, there's a, a, let me call it a literature. I mean, the, the economics profession is, very much aware of a lot of issues and aspects of this debate and of these consequences and of these causes. The main problem that we have is how to get that sold or translated to policymakers, to politicians, to uh, journalists, to the broader public. Because one thing is that all, all these many smart people that I listen to and, and whose work I read, Okay, we, we talk about many of these issues in a very technical way. And then part of what I've been trying to do with this book is precisely that. Can, can we tell that you know, story to a broader audience that translate all this knowledge that this bunch of smart people that I get my inspiration from, can I translate this into a way that is much 
more accessible. I don't think the concepts or the broad ideas are hard. They may be sophisticated, but you know, we have a, a large fraction of sophisticated readers and, and, and audiences out there. But people may not be versed in all the technicalities of you know the models that academic economists use and things like that. And so there's there's an, an, an attempt here to try and, and bring this in a way that tells you at the same time what's going on, what the facts are, what the myths are, because some of these things, you know, you tell someone at a, a cocktail party and after two drinks for sure, and you say that there's fewer startups now than in the 90s, and they say, are you crazy? I mean, this is the high tech time. Uh, uh, this, 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 this cannot be. Well, then I don't have the time to take out my, you know, my phone and start to look up some, some facts and, you know, here it is. I mean, this is, you know, the central bank or the, or the Federal Reserve that has published it. I mean, you know, people just don't, don't believe this, but, but it's, it's important to, to communicate this and to, to find a way to bring this to a broader audience that there's a bunch of things going on that we actually understand quite a, a lot about and to hopefully convince policymakers and politicians that this is an important uh, aspect. I mean, uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar has, 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 has a book out recently that dealing more with the legal side of the same argument. And I think it's, it's a number of steps going in the same direction, trying to understand what is going on with society, the legal aspect, the economic aspect, and try and communicate this to the broader audience. I like that because it makes me think of how, let's say, epidemiologists and virologists may be talking about uh, the viruses and bacteria and their spread and what may come up. And then nobody really pays attention until when it gets to become an issue that everybody's like, oh, these are the experts. Same thing with economics. They're like, these trends are happening. It's going in this direction. Everybody's like, okay, it's all right. Until it gets close to maybe there's an issue. And suddenly we need an economist out here because this is blown up. That's funny. But I guess that makes sense. Each of us have our strengths that we compel into the world. My last thing I would like to check is if you have a if you had a megaphone to talk to all people of the planet, what would be a message you would want to tell them about your book? I would say be very careful when you see the Dow Jones going up and going up and concluding that the economy is in good shape. I would say if it's going up that fast, I'd be worried. I'd be worried because something is actually wrong. A competitive market means that you know there's competition between firms. That means that profits are being eroded. You can get some profits because you're the first mover innovator, but eventually these get eroded. If these profits stay high for a long time, that's not a good sign. And that is translated in these high stock market valuations, but that's not a good sign for a healthy economy. And we have to, if you're really worried about you know a well-functioning competitive economy, that should be an alarm bell. That should be something that worries you. I like the perspective you bring up there because it's the opposite of what it would look like from seeing green lights and things are on the up. This is wonderful. Jan, I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show and bringing a lot of informative value to a category of economics, which is not as much talked about on this show, but is very valuable to the Earth's interconnected markets. Thank you, Armand. This was a wonderful conversation. Wonderful. And we are out.